It all started in the beginning. Man and woman created gloriously in his image and left to choose we traded holiness for coverage, but no leaves could cover the nakedness and wreckage and we found ourselves exposed. See though, in that moment a promise was spoken that showed us God's relentless devotion to make us his. Bankrupt of righteousness, we ran in the opposite direction looking for satisfaction by our own analysis. Trapped, broken, bound by our own chains, with nothing but sin's venom coursing through our veins, our nations warred, injustice reigned with impunity, and nothing short of death was the future of humanity. Then Jesus stepped in to our helpless estate. He said, I will deliver, I will strengthen, I will restore, I'll bring redemption. This promise sounds familiar from our ancestors in Genesis. Could he be the one, the fulfiller, that will free us? I see the work of his hands. My heart burns as he stands in front of me. Will I follow is his plea. Leave behind the debris of my sin and shame to find redemption in his name. There's joy, there's peace that makes no sense at all. My shame and my grief present since the fall are down flat on their face. I have freedom in their place. With Jesus for the first time, I feel like I can run this race. But now he's been taken. They cry for Barabbas and to crucify the Son, crucify the one that said, I will deliver, I will strengthen, I will restore, I'll bring redemption. Maybe our chance for deliverance was just a mirage. Maybe our indifference has locked us in this collage of irritation and humiliation, destined for separation from the very God we owe a debt. But it's not over yet. You see, my days were filled with sorrow, but that changed real quick because the tomb was only borrowed. I can now know that his promises are true because the grave was just a ruse. And in the middle of the celebrations of hell, Jesus said he's got a new story to tell. And now because of Jesus, I have hope. I can persevere. Washed in his blood, things are now so clear. I learned that the darkness of Friday was just the shadow of his wings. And Sunday has taken me back to what he said in the beginning, where he said, I will deliver. I will strengthen. I will restore. I'll bring redemption. Every single one of us has made and received promises in our lives. Some of the promises have been kept and others have, have not been, sadly. Some are still in process and some are completely done. Well, the God of the Bible makes promises all throughout its 66 books. And I believe that many of them have already been fulfilled and that some of them are still in process. But not everyone sees it the same way. Some of the promises that God has made are very difficult to believe, especially if you have the philosophical assumption that miracles just simply can't and don't happen. As a pastor over the past 20 years, I've had numerous people tell me, you know, I like certain parts about Christianity, but there are some parts that I just can't believe. Well, I can understand that. But for me, it all comes down to one single promise and what God did to deliver on that promise. In Genesis 3, after sin was introduced into the world, God made a promise to buy back and to redeem and to restore fallen mankind. The New Testament centers on the idea that Jesus came to fulfill that promise by paying for our sins by a substitutionary death, by being buried and then rising from the dead on the third day. So no matter what you believe, the things that are hard for us to believe are really answered in one thing, in the resurrection. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then 
Why worry about any of what he said? But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. The issue on which everything hangs is the resurrection of Jesus. Can I trust God? Can I wait on his promises? Can I believe it? It isn't an issue of whether or not I like it or am inclined to agree with it. It's, it's really an issue of whether or not the resurrection is true. This is how the first hearers who heard about the resurrection felt. They knew that if it was true, it absolutely changed everything about the way that we live. And it also meant that we didn't have to be afraid of anything anymore. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then we have a promise. So did he rise from the dead? Well, standing here in the city where it's claimed that he did rise from the dead, can we honestly say that he did? Most people think that the burden of proof when it comes to the resurrection is on believers to give evidence, but I don't think that that's entirely true. Because if the resurrection isn't true, the non-believers also need to, need to provide proof. It's not enough to simply say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You also have to come up with a historically feasible explanation of the birth and expansion of the church. It's said that people in the first century did not have the scientific knowledge that we have today. It's proposed that they were more inclined to believe in supernatural things. Therefore, they could have easily fallen prey to the reports that, that of risen Jesus was true. His followers were heartbroken when Jesus died. They believed that he was the Messiah. So of course, they could have easily sensed that he was still with them to the point that they may have even had visions of him. And over time, they kept talking about him and sharing stories to the extent that the gospel accounts were devised many, many years later in order to bolster the idea that Jesus had been resurrected. Now. While the previous example does sound plausible, it doesn't accurately reflect the historical and cultural context. So let's look at the reasons, the arguments, and the counter-arguments for and against the resurrection of Jesus. For the sake of our discussion here today, I'm going to assume that we can agree that there actually was a historical person named Jesus, and that we can agree that he was crucified on a Roman cross. See, seven different documents confirm this, including the Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus, the Syrian philosopher Mara Bersepian, and the Assyrian cynic Lucian of Samosta. I'm also going to assume that he was buried, despite the classically held belief that the Romans did not allow crucified criminals to be buried. Today, Several ossuary boxes containing the buried remains from the first, from first century people have been found and they've been identified containing large nails or stakes through the ankles. So this seemingly disproves the idea that Jesus could not have been buried as there is historical evidence demonstrating that some who were crucified were indeed buried. Now, the resurrection, <laughs> that's different. Is there any proof? Many people who are skeptical of the resurrection of Jesus argue that Jesus was indeed crucified, but after that, one of two things happened. Someone or someone stole his body to make it look like he had been resurrected, or the disciples simply kept talking like he had been resurrected until years later it began to be accepted. However, neither of those two ideas sufficiently deal with the historical and cultural data surrounding the actual resurrection. The first recorded accounts of the resurrection are not found in the Gospels, but instead they're actually found in the letters of Paul, which historians agree were written within 15 years of the actual death of Jesus, and not 30 to 40 years like the Gospels. One of the more interesting texts is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. Paul says, 
For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he actually appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one born ab abnormally. So Paul speaks not only of the empty tomb, but also of the witnesses, both of which could actually be verified by everyone that Paul wrote to. These two pieces of evidence alone can be refuted, but together they present strong evidence. If there were only an empty tomb and no witnesses, well, then it could be claimed that his body was stolen by his followers. And if there were only the accounts and no actual empty tomb, then no one would have concluded that it was a resurrection because people's accounts of seeing departed loved ones happened all the time. Only if the factors were both true could you actually conclude that Jesus was raised from the dead. Paul therefore indicates that there were a little over 500 witnesses to the bodily resurrection of Jesus, many of whom you can still talk to today. So if, you've ha if you have doubts, go to Jerusalem, see the place, ask the people for yourself. And at this point, travel was very easy around the Mediterranean because of the Pax Romana. So it wasn't impossible, it wasn't an impossible challenge. Paul couldn't have made such a challenge and re remained unquestioned if those eyewitnesses didn't exist. So today, you can visit the traditional sites that are thought to contain the empty tomb like the one behind me. But certainly that alone doesn't confirm the resurrection of Jesus. Do we know for sure where he was buried? No. But we do know that he was buried in a rich man's tomb, despite not owning anything himself. All of this was in fulfillment of God's promises. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. That's what Isaiah says. Additionally, the accounts of the witnesses to the resurrection in the Bible are a little too problematic to be fabrications. Each gospel writer states that the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection were actually women. Women's low status in that culture meant that their testimony could not be used as evidence in a court or in a court of law. So there was no possible advantage to recording that they were the first witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. This could have completely undermined the credibility of the testimony. The only possible reason for stating over and over that women were the first to see Jesus is if it were actually true. I'm sure that there was enormous pressure to change the story and to add weight to the account, but the first believers did not do that. And these first accounts must have been incredibly exciting and life-changing. So the testimony of the empty grave and the eyewitness accounts together gives us proof of the resurrection. If it was only the grave, the disciples could have been accused of taking his body, like we said. If it was only the eyewitnesses, they could have been accused of seeing these apparitions. But there's actually more evidence. Again, Paul records that from the very beginning, Christians proclaimed Jesus' bodily resurrection, which meant that you could go and visit the tomb, you could talk to the witnesses. Jesus appeared to over 500 people at once, as we said. So Paul could not be telling people in a public letter that there were scores of witnesses if it were not true. We can't allow ourselves to think that the resurrection accounts of Jesus were made up after the fact to create a new religion. Whatever else actually occurred, there must have been an empty tomb 
and scores of witnesses to the bodily resurrection of Christ. Without knowing what else happened, the tomb of Jesus must have been empty, and hundreds of witnesses must have claimed that they saw him. It's also important to note that there was not a common belief in the bodily resurrection in this particular culture either. The idea that the followers of Jesus made up the resurrection account would suppose that they actually expected the Jewish and Gentile hearers to be open to the belief that an individual could be raised from the dead. Well, that was just not the case. First of all, the Greco-Roman mind believed that the soul and the spirit was immaterial and that it was good, and that the body itself was material and that it was bad. So if a person died and the soul was separated from the body, it was actually liberated or free. So in this worldview, resurrection was not only impossible, but it was also something that no one would want. Even those who believed in kind of the idea of reincarnation would have recognized that this would mean that your soul was still imprisoned. And the goal was instead to get free of the prison. Now what about the Jewish worldview? Well, the Jewish worldview would also reject the idea of an individual resurrection. In the Jewish mindset, death was not seen as liberation, but as a tragedy. So the idea of a bodily resurrection uh, was believed, but not in the sense of the individual. It was believed that eventually, a bodily resurrection of all the people of God would occur. And at the same time, all evil, all injustice, all war would cease. So to claim that an individual was raised while the world remained unchanged would be absolute foolishness. The idea of the resurrection would have been an impossible idea to imagine as a Jew or a Greek. So the followers of Jesus were not adopting something already present and they weren't making up a story about it occurring. No, they were proclaiming something radical, something new, and something incredibly hard to believe. It's simply not enough just for the skeptic to deny or dismiss the resurrection and the teaching about the resurrection of Jesus by saying that it, it just couldn't have happened. You have to actually answer some of the historical questions if you're going to believe or deny the resurrection. There's just a few historical questions that I still want to point out and that need to be addressed. First, how did the message of the church spread so quickly if the resurrection was a fabrication? No group of Jews had ever worshipped a human being as God, so what led them to change like virtually overnight? Well, the book of Acts accounts for us that after Jesus spent some time with his followers and he appeared to several hundred people, he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives right over here. And then shortly after that, on Pentecost, the Jewish festival of weeks, the Holy Spirit then descended upon the believers and they all began to proclaim the truth about Jesus. One of them, Peter, the one who had previously run away, he would hid himself and also denied Jesus. After he saw the resurrected Jesus, he responded in a very different way. From here, he began to preach in front of thousands of people, right here, near the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And what did he declare? What did the entire movement of the church and Christianity from here on out declare? Well, they declared the resurrection of Jesus, not the teachings of Jesus. They talked about what they had seen, not about what they had been taught. Now, generally speaking, new ideas tend to get talked about for a while, and then they get dis discussed over time before they're really declared and believed. 
I know we live in an age with the internet where all of that seems to have changed. However, it still takes some time for a new worldview to emerge or for a new teaching to come to light. But not so with Christianity. It happened overnight. People who were previously scared and running for their lives are now boldly proclaiming that Jesus is God in the flesh. They're saying, you killed him. Say you're sorry and believe. That is actually historically documented. So if the resurrection didn't occur, how do you explain this change? How do you explain the spread of the church around the entire known world so quickly? Well, I believe it occurred because people could actually verify these things. And there's one more thing to keep in mind. Nearly all of the original witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus went to the grave for their belief. I love what Pascal said. He said, I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. Well, virtually all of the apostles and the early Christian leaders were murdered for their faith. And it's hard to believe that anyone would do that, go to the grave to support a hoax. So what do we do with the resurrection? It's a challenge. If you're skeptical, I can certainly understand your skepticism. There isn't any evidence in history that we can produce that will prove something like you can prove it in a science lab. But there is more historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus than most other historical events that we seem to take for granted. Every effort to explain away the empty grave and the first witnesses flies in the face of the cultural context of Jesus' day. Why would you say it if you didn't see it? Why would you claim that women were the first? You wouldn't, unless they were actually the first. Every effort to explain the, the change in the apostles from scared and running to bold and proclaiming falls apart if the resurrection isn't valid. And every attempt at explaining the rapid growth of the church, the quick adoption of the ideas about the resurrection in the days when people, especially those in Jerusalem, could verify it. Every attempt falls short unless we short circuit the work of answering the very tough historical questions. Well, I sympathize with you who think that you can come up with another explanation. The first century Christians found the resurrection just as hard and just as inconceivable as you. They had just as much trouble with the claims of the resurrection as you. And yet the evidence of the claims of the eyewitnesses and the changed lives of the early believers was absolutely overwhelming. Even if you can't yet believe the resurrection, the truth is that you should want it to be true. I know that we long for justice and we long for equality. We, we long for the poor to be fed. Yet, if your worldview is that we just came into exi existence merely by accident and the world will eventually burn up and cease to exist, well, that undermines any motivation to make the world a better place. Why should we, if in the end, that nothing that we do will make a difference anyway? 
However, if the resurrection of Jesus happened, that means that there's infinite hope and reason to pour ourselves out for the needs of the world. Let me leave you with a quote from N.T. Wright. The message of the resurrection is that this world matters, that the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won. If Easter means that Jesus Christ was only raised in a spiritual sense, then it's only about me and me finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world, news which warms our hearts precisely because it isn't just about warming hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things, and that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement this victory of Jesus over them all. Take away Easter, and Karl Marx was probably right to accuse Christianity of ignoring the problems of the material world. Take it away, and Freud was probably right to say that Christianity is wish fulfillment. Take it away and Nietzsche probably was right to say that it was for wimps. But God made a promise, a promise to restore a broken and sin-cursed world and the resurrection of Jesus is proof that he will keep that promise and he's already doing it. So a promise is really only as uh, is really only good if we believe it and trust it. I know that I have a lot of friends who are skeptical, and maybe you're still skeptical. But at some point, every single one of us realizes that there are major problems in our world. We all realize that there are things that are just disgusting and things that we are upset about, things that, things that keep us awake at night. And if we're honest, we've contributed to the chaos. So when we look at the the problems in our world, and we look at our contribution, I think every single one of us has to ask and answer a question. What am I going to do with my mess? I guess that's why I'm so passionate about the resurrection of Jesus. You may have parts of Christianity that you struggle with. That's okay. But the one thing that I hope that you'll think about and to take into consideration is that Jesus did actually live that perfect life that we, we wish we could live. And he did do it for you. And then he did go in fulfilling God's promise. He did go to a cross. His body was broken. His blood was poured out for one purpose, to pay for my sins and for yours. And so at the end of the day, if you don't believe in Jesus, what do you do with the problem of your sin? Because someone has to pay for it. So I plead with you, please look to Jesus and see that he did all of this for you, even though it's hard to believe.